Leonard Fajardo, and I'm a bookseller here at Politics and Prose. So on behalf of the owners and of the staff, I would like to welcome all of you to your favorite bookstore for this evening's event. As you may already know, Politics and Prose have gone back to hosting in-person events, along with our virtual book events, partnered events, trips, and classes. So please check our website for a full list. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, for the Q&A, please remember to step up to the microphone by the pillar over here before asking your questions so we can not only hear and enjoy the conversation, but to also ensure that it is going to be recorded. Please silence your cell phones. We don't want them to ring while the event is ongoing. Um, if you, for those of you who want to buy copies of the book, there are copies right behind the cash registers out front. We will be doing a signing after the Q&A. So if you'd like to get your book signed, please once again line up by the pillar uh, over here. And lastly, once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help us out a bit. Switch off my phone. Switch off, yes. I, <laughs> yes, please switch off or silence your cell phones. Uh, now onto the main event. I am honored to introduce Dr. Thomas Gabor to all of you. Dr. Gabor is the president of Thomas Gabor LLC, a criminal justice consulting firm based in Florida. He served as a professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa. Ottawa from 1981 to 2011. He has received the American Society of Criminology's prestigious Jean Cart Prize for his research on crime displacement. The Department of Homeland Security has designated him as an, an individual of ex extraordinary ability. He has also been in inducted into the Canadian Criminology's Who's Who and has been nominated for several teaching awards. This evening, he will be talking about his new book, American Carnage, which he co-wrote with Fred Gutenberg, uh, who lost his beloved daughter, Jamie, in the 2018 Parkland School shooting. Using strong evidence-based research, Dr. Gap Gabor and Fred Gutenberg debunked many of the myths and slogans being peddled by Second Amendment interest groups and their lobbies that has made the United States an outlier in the developed world in terms of gun deaths. Especially, especially in children. Cassandra Kerfasi, co-director of the Center for Gun Violence Solution, Solu Solutions, calls American Carnage an essential read for anyone seeking to counter fiction with fact in their efforts to reduce gun violence in the United States. Dr. Gabor will be in conversation with Chris Brown. She is the president of Brady, the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence, one of America's oldest and boldest gun violence prevention groups. She combines a lifelong background in policy, law, and grassroots activism with considerable tr strategic management expertise to help forge the direction of the organization's programs and ensure the successful impact of its national and field assets. A veteran of gun violence prevention work, she started her career on Capitol Hill working for Representative Jim Moran, advocating for the bill that would eventually become the groundbreaking Brady Bill requiring background checks on federally licensed gun sales. So everyone, let us all welcome Dr. Thomas Gabor and Chris Brown. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I am one of those people who uh, leads a gun violence prevention organization. Obviously, uh, Brady, uh, United Against Gun Violence, founded by Jim and Sarah Brady, uh, fighting to end gun violence in this country. And I'm so uh, privileged to be with someone like Tom, this incredible, accomplished author who has done so much in his life and now is with us tonight as a co-author with Fred, who can't be with us, Fred Guttenberg, um, who lost his daughter, Jamie, to gun violence in 2018. And I've talked to Fred a lot about the issue um, over the years. And what we, what we talk about a lot is that Fred was not someone who was an activist before his daughter was killed. That it's gun violence, what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School that changed that. And that was Valentine's Day, 2018. 
and it changed the trajectory of his life. For a long time, once he joined Brady, what he wanted was to tell the story of the lies that had so long, really for 30 years, animated um, the story of why you should buy guns in this country, right? Yeah. Told by the National Rifle Association. And I'm so grateful uh, that Fred found someone like Tom, uh, a storied and incredibly rigorous and detailed journalist to help him tell that story. Um, Tom won't say it, so I'm going to say it a little bit about why that's so important. Um, Tom has uh, worked on over 200 books, uh, research reports, journal articles, and, and media contributions. His acclaimed book, Confronting Gun Violence in America, has solidified his standing as a leading authority on firearms and public safety. And his newest book, which we are, thankfully, here to discuss, um, that will introduce and has introduced, it's a bestseller, by the way, um, across this country, readers across this country to a more balanced, rich, detailed, and fact-based understanding about gun violence in this country. And that's really what the folks who founded Brady, Jim and Sarah, were all about. So I could not be more thrilled to engage in a conversation with you, Tom, about what drew you to collaborate with Fred and uh, you know, put together really debunking myths and lies, really, about uh, guns in this country. So thank you. Thank you for your work, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for your gracious introduction. And I'd also like to thank you for your leadership in this area, your support and support of our efforts, and your activism, which I understand is longstanding in this area. And the Brady Organization, because I think um, Chris is far too modest, um, is one of the first, if not the first, major organizations in this country trying to deal with gun violence, going back to the 70s, I believe. And um, they are really one of the foremost organizations is doing research and litigation, activism in this area, publications. So it's an honor to be with you here this evening. And thanks for coming out because I know you've had a very long day today. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out today. And I just want to say a shout out um, to my co-author, Fred Gutenberg, as uh, both Chris has mentioned and in the earlier introduction. He has suffered the most unimaginable, devastating loss that any of us can experience, the loss of a child, 14-year-old Jamie, who would be 20 this summer. And uh, there's so much that's happened since she was born in 2003, and he often talks about it, how we've doubled, for example, in the inventory of firearms here in the United States since 2003. Uh, how if you we were looking at these assault-style weapons like the AR-15, back in when Jamie was born, about 2% of all firearm sales in America were of the AR-15 type. Now it's 25%. So we are a nation not just awash in firearms, about 400 million at least, and ghost guns, as Fred often adds. Uh, but a wash in these military-style weapons. And don't let anybody tell you <coughs> that these weapons are sporting guns. They were designed, I've had countless exchanges on the internet with people who claim that these are sporting weapons, self-defense weapons, or useful for hunting and all that. That's complete nonsense. There's at least three people who were involved in the 1950s in the design of the AR-15 who have said that 
Eugene Stoner being one of them, that this was designed for military use. It's been slightly modified and became the M16 uh, during Vietnam. These are military-style weapons designed for military use. In fact, there was no civilian market for these guns back in the 1950s. So, but as far as just uh, Chris asked, uh, this book in particular, because, uh, you know, I've been a professor for many years, so I can go on and on, and I don't want to monopolize the, sta <laughs> the stage here. But um, basically how this book came about is back around six years ago. I started seeing these myths and misconceptions and uh, downright lies being spread on social media and articles through slogans and so forth. So I started cataloging them, thinking that one day I'll write a book on these myths. And um, then along came this horror in Parkland, which is just about three quarters of a, an hour down the road from where I live. And um, the March for Our Lives youth, remember the youth who came forward, David Hogg and the others, they were crying out for solutions. They said, we desperately need solutions. So I put this project down and wrote a book called Enough, which is a book of solutions. And Brady, by the way, helped me distribute that book to every senator. It was during the pandemic, so there were many U.S. senators, many obstacles, but that you know came about. And then during the pandemic, because there was so, such an increase in mass shootings, I wrote a book called Carnage, which really hasn't made its way around a lot because of the pandemic. It's a book on mass shootings. Uh, and then um, I reached out to Fred because I thought it was important to write this book on myths and misconceptions. And Fred, who was very aware of the myths and misconceptions and lies and the damage they were doing in this country, uh, was happy to join me. And we've been working together on this for the last two years. And um, I guess the rest is history. Uh, so I guess this gave him an opportunity to base his activism on evidence and research evidence and as well amplified the message. So it's been a wonderful collaboration on a very difficult topic. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for your scholarship. Thank you for the um, uh, collaboration that you've given someone who is a dear friend of mine, Fred, who, uh, as he tells it to both of us, now we have become friends, uh, uh, is someone who is part of a club that he never wanted to be a member of. And that is the legacy of, of gun violence in this country. And if you look at some of the uh, research that's coming out three or four years from now, every American in this country will be a member of that club. They will either know someone or have been impacted directly by gun violence. And so I'm just asking you, I, I noted a little bit of an accent, Tom, in, uh, in, in your voice. And so I just would like to know a little bit more from you. Um, you're an academic, admittedly. Yes. Um, but what drew you in particular to this topic from a personal standpoint? We know what drew Fred, but I'd like you to share with everyone here, what drew you in particular to the topic of gun violence? And uh, can you tell us a little bit of, about yourself before I start probing you on other things? Absolutely, thanks for asking. I've been teaching and doing research in the area of violence for about 40 years, so I'm dating myself here a little bit. Uh, and in the early 90s, I was teaching in Canada at the University of Ottawa. I got my PhD at Ohio State, so I have a strong link with the United States as well. And um, the Department of Justice in Canada approached me to do a review of the research that had been done up to that point. Canada was a leader in terms of working with the United Nations on an in international initiative in this area. 
And uh, it, it was interesting that you asked because while I was steeped in the violence literature and research, I hadn't any strong background um, in, on gun violence in particular, and I had no strong axe to grind. I was not a survivor, members of my family did not have a history of either gun ownership or being victims of gun violence. So I kind of came to it from a fairly neutral perspective, if you wish, or a more objective perspective. Um, and I was stunned when I looked at the literature and I found that, you know, I, knew, I was aware of the debates on this topic and I found that um, hands down, uh, the literature did support uh, some strong restrictions on firearms. And that, you know, this slogan, guns don't kill, people do, uh, that in fact the weapon did matter and mattered in a significant way. So that's how my involvement began. And then I was involved with the United Nations looking at firearms regulation around the world. I was also involved in another very tragic case similar to our Sandy Hook disaster here uh, up in Newtown, uh, Dunblane, Scotland. There was a murder there in 1996, a mass killing in the schools. Uh, a man who was in his early 40s murdered 16 first grade students there, as well as a teacher. And that created, a, led to a national inquiry. So they handled it differently in the UK. And I had the privilege of being asked by the victims' families to make a submission to Lord Cullen's report, the justice who was responsible for this national commission, and uh, was told that my submission was influential in a very uh, significant tightening of the laws which re with regard to handguns in the UK. And the UK really has had an improvement uh, much significant lowering of handgun violence since then. Um, so those were a couple of highlights, I guess. I've been involved in this area. And then as far as writing books uh, in 2016, as you say, you know, since then, this is my fifth book on the subject. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy to see that organizations like Brady, with the help of Chris Brown, and uh, Fred Gutenberg uh, is you know, helping get that message out about the myths and the dangerous myths that are out there now being propagated by the gun lobby and its allies. Yeah, and I think, well, thank you um, for everything that you've done to really uh, combat in so many ways uh, misinformation and disinformation that we're dealing with across this country. On our issue of, of guns and gun violence, we all know as Americans uh, how pervasive the myths are that uh, really shape our day-to-day -day lives. Things like more guns uh, make us safer. That the only thing that combats a uh, bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And you have very consciously with Fred uh, taken on so many of these myths. And you've not just called them myths, you've called them lies, and they are lies. Can you talk to us a little bit about the process of trying to distill in a book <laughs> uh, uh, among hundreds of myths, what would be uh, those that you would take on among the, you know, 30 or 40 in your book, and how you went about the research process of this uh, to, to distill the facts. Yeah, well, you know, it did help that I was doing research in this area for a number of years and had kind of a, a, a pretty solid foundation in this area of research. But, um, you know, and as you say, there are hundreds and hundreds of myths out there. But, you know, there are some core ones, and I think a determining factor to what ended up being in the book. We have about 37 core myths that we tackle. And uh, they're the ones that are most often, we see them most often repeated. And in some cases, they are part of not just lies and misinformation, but I'm glad Chris used the term disinformation. For example, 
that slogan that Chris mentioned, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. You know, you might remember the first time we heard that it was five days after the Sandy Hook slaughter of 20 school children, six teachers and school staff. And um, it, they, it was five days after that event. I think the NRA was scrambling to come up with a position on it. And we thought maybe it would come around a little bit in terms of universal background checks and improving, which I think we have to do, actually strengthening background checks and other measures as well. Um, and instead, they doubled down. They doubled down on the notion that, no, we need arm to arm teachers and so forth. And basically, the notion of arming the citizenry of America, this is, you know, uh, this is the core set of myths that we've tackled. So, you know, that's part of a disinformation campaign where they consciously came out with a slogan, and they've done it on a number of occasions. Uh, it's hard to trace each slogan and where it comes from. But, and it was designed, it was a strategic choice that was made by the NRA and the industry in some cases to pursue a certain direction. And they decided that if they make a concession, you know, the slippery slope theory, that if we make one concession in this area, we allow for universal background checks, which by the way, they supported. Wayne LaPierre, CEO of the NRA, supported universal background checks. That means on every transfer of a firearm in the country, back in 1999. But instead, they've become even more of an extremist organization and they've decided that if they make one concession, it's a slippery slope and bit by bit, we're going to eat away at the rights of gun owners until we move to confiscating firearms. And that's one of the biggest lies because there is no history of universal disarmament in the United States. Uh, so it's nonsense, and in fact, if we look at the inventory today, uh, we've seen just since Sandy Hook, since 2012, 150 million more firearms in circulation in the United States. And we've seen a situation where, I've just looked at the numbers recently, that the polls tell us that we have five times as many Americans since 20, just since 2017 who are carrying guns on a daily or almost daily basis. And we've seen, as Chris mentioned, right now it's about 52% of Americans, according to Kaiser Health, have a personal connection with gun violence. Either they've experienced gun violence, a family member has, they've witnessed gun violence. Um, uh, so 52%. Uh, of Americans now have a personal experience with gun violence. So with these more extremist policies and expanding gun rights, which we're seeing in so many states, 26 states now require no permit to carry, no training, no knowledge of the law, nothing. Uh, we are seeing a more dire, I don't think I have to tell anybody here, a more dire situation. We have almost two mass shootings a day on average now in the United States. Yeah. Um, yes, that's the reality. We have 48,000 plus Americans who are dying every year from gun violence. Uh, more, more than that, approximately 80,000 are shot and survive those injuries. Mm -hmm. And in the backdrop of the pandemic, of course, we've seen a 64% increase in gun sales. And what we're finding is that the range and the scope of gun violence is something that all Americans are experiencing. It doesn't matter where you live, where you go, you're concerned about it. It's either in your home, where you walk, where you worship, where you drop your kids at school. And uh, Tom, I think the the important thing about what you and Fred have done is really attempt to debunk uh, the uh, disinformation campaign, and that's what I call it, of the National Rifle Association that was very well funded. Now they're, they are in decline, 
and they should be, but uh, for 30 years they spent the vast majority of their revenue on an, an ad agency. And what that ad agency attempted to do, it's called Ackerman McQueen, with which Wayne LaPierre had an interest, an economic interest, um, is to propagate the lie. The lie is nothing stops a bad guy with a gun like a good guy with a gun, that more guns make us safer. And you take that on among many other things in your book. I'd like to understand, with you having worked with Fred for a long time on this, um, what are the things that you think, for folks here today, um, are important as takeaways to think about action steps that are important for individuals here to understand um, we have these myths, we have this big distortion machine. I talk to a lot of people as the head of Brady who say, what can we do? So I'm asking you, Tom, what, what can we do uh, here today, all of us as individuals, uh, to make a difference? Thanks for asking that, Chris, because there's a great deal that we can do. You know, one of the things I come across all the time uh, frequently speaking and so forth and on social media so many people feel our situation is hopeless they feel and this is a big myth it's not even one that we discussed in the, in our book is that the gun lobby is all powerful all knowing all powerful and change will never happen and indeed change is stubborn and they are have been a powerful lobby group but they're not all powerful and um, they've experienced considerable disarray in the last few years. But uh, while we're waiting for Congress to act, because of course, one of the parties in Congress has been obstructing any change for close to 40 years now, is there's still a lot that the average citizen can do. And I'm hopeful also because I see more young people involved. I understand the group you probably have heard of the group Moms Demand Action. Okay, so there's a Students Demand Action, and somebody just informed me the other day that the number of chapters recently has doubled. You know, so there's more grassroots involvement. We've also seen no less a poll than Fox poll, right? Uh, has told us that over 80% of Americans favor not just universal background checks, but red flag laws, ra raising the minimum age for gun purchasing and so forth. So I'm hopeful in general, but what can the average citizen can do? You can do a whole lot. First and foremost, you can get out and vote. But um, make sure that gun violence and the positions that candidates hold on gun violence are very strong and they make specific commitments to change and to support legislation uh, in a very specific way. So instead of, you know, a lot, you'll hear a lot of platitudes, well, you know, I prioritize gun violence and all that. Well, we need to know whether the people we're electing, do they support background checks? Do they support an assault weapons ban? Do they support red flag laws? Do they support raising the age? And one of the big ones, by the way, is the law, it's called PLACA, that shields the firearms industry. I think that's one of the big ones that needs to be changed. And by the way, that will uh, pass muster as far as the current Supreme Court is concerned, because there is no analog to the PLACA law going back in the early days of the Republic. But as far as what you can do, please look at candidates, the commitments they're making. They have to be specific, because then we can hold them accountable if they don't follow through. The, uh, there are many other things. I know people who are involved in gun buybacks, and um, uh, there's groups, including ones in Florida, called Lock It Up, where they're trying to actually reach gun owners. They're participating in volunteer groups to get gun owners to store, to lock up their guns, because this is another travesty in the country. We are one of the few countries, high-income countries, that don't have a national safe storage law. And about 40% of gun owners 
don't lock up, don't secure their guns properly in the home. Millions of children in the United States live in a home where there are multiple guns that aren't being stored safely. And with the emphasis today on um, uh, self-defense, so this is one of the things that happened over the years that the gun industry and the lobby started promoting self-defense and arming the citizenry as opposed to hunting, which was on decline and sp shooting sports, is that more people are keeping their guns loaded and accessible. And that means uh, that a young person might be more likely to get a hold of the gun. We've seen that in multiple school shootings. You can have teenage suicides that are often impulsive, uh, horrible accidents in the home, and so forth. So uh, certainly safe storage is a very important thing. And so one can participate in programs where you educate owners and um, make available to them gun locks and so forth so that they'll secure their guns. That's this kind of thing that can be done without passing any laws at all. I'm a big believer in economic activism. I don't think Americans have flexed their, mu flex their muscles in this area at all. Uh, and most Americans are in support of change. So, for example, if you don't approve of a a particular um, store, a large store that selling assault weapons, don't patronize that store. You know, and there's much we can do to flex our economic muscles. Investment, investor activism is another one. Make sure, if you have an issue with supporting the gun industry, make sure that when you have your uh, 401ks, your portfolios, that there are no gun stocks in there somewhere hidden in mutual funds and so forth. Uh, as well, there was a case of, uh, just give you a brief anecdote because I know we're getting a little bit short of time. Uh, there were some sisters, Dominican sisters out in the Northwestern United States. We know who, them, okay. they're great. Okay, so yeah. you're more aware, maybe do you want to share that story because, no, you, okay. Yes, no, we, we, yeah. we worked with, uh, uh, some uh, folks who were uh, Dominican sisters who were advocates of change uh, and decided that they would um, activate others in their order uh, around shareholder meetings of publicly traded companies and show up and uh, demand that they change any investment that they had made in any gun manufacturers. And they made a difference in a number of uh, different publicly held organizations that were actually investing in gun manufacturers that were um, really not focused at all on any kinds of mechanisms to make their firearms more safe, but maybe yeah. Tom, you're referencing something else I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, no, referencing the same thing. But I just wanted to say we provide a list of things in the book on what in every citizen can do so that you don't feel powerless. Um, so, you know, take a look at that if you'd like to look at the book. But I think one of the biggest myths is that the country is hopelessly divided because, yes, it's a polarized country, but polarized more on extremes because if you look at politically, 42% of Americans now are independents politically, okay? And public opinion has shifted one way because of the gun lobbies campaign uh, that more people believe that you're safer in your home with a gun. So that's one of the reasons we wrote this book, to disabuse people of that idea because we know it's a great falsehood. Uh, so don't believe that. And don't believe the fact that we're hopelessly divided. 80% or more of Americans, depending on the measure, support change in this area, support taking action, support changes in law. But in the meantime, until that change takes place, there are countless things that we can do and we provide a list in the book. So I don't want to spoil your read. Um, I, I don't think you've spoiled anyone's read. And I would encourage you, if you've not yet read American Carnage, you, you really should. And please 
share it with everyone else that you come in contact with. It's so very important. Um, I want to give room for folks in the audience to ask questions. I will just, before I, I turn it over to Tom uh, to answer questions, and I'm happy to amplify in any response uh, to questions that you all have. I was on Capitol Hill yesterday. Um, Leader Jeffries uh, called members of the gun violence prevention community to Capitol Hill uh, for a conversation because some of you may have seen that uh, House leadership on the minority side have discharge petitions to put forward three bills. One is to expand Brady background checks that passed in 2018 and 2020, and it should pass now, but we have a different leadership. Uh, and so uh, they're seeking 218 signatures to make that happen. Right now they have 210. Um, they're also uh, moving forward a discharge petition to close the Charleston loophole. That's the loophole that allows a gun sale to happen even when no background check is completed. It's called that because that's how the shooter in Charleston, South Carolina, obtained his gun and shot Reverend Pinckney, whose widow and children I met when we tried to and did successfully pass uh, a closure on that. Um, that's how he obtained his weapon. And it killed Reverend Pinckney and eight other people. And it's an assault weapons ban. And we're trying to make these things an issue. Uh, but over time, I will say, as someone as a veteran of the Hill, I spent eight years on the Hill when I was way younger than I am now. Um, that was not always successful. But we have leadership now, thanks to the movement and thanks, like, thanks to people like Tom and thanks to all of you showing up where we can make a difference around this issue. And it's just so important because gun violence is the number one killer of our kids in America and Three or four years from now, based on the studies that are coming out, there's not an American in this country who will not be directly or indirectly impacted by gun violence. And that means each and every one of you here will either be shot or you will know someone who's shot. And that's a uniquely American problem. And we cannot possibly believe that we are a country worth living in if that's true. And I'm telling you that as a mom, my partner is also here, a Naval Academy graduate. Uh, Bruce, raise your hand. Um, with two sons, one in the Naval Academy. We can't have this be our place in America. So I just have to say thank you, Tom, together with Fred, who <coughs> says he was not active or involved in this issue, and he wishes he was, but his daughter was shot at the safest school in this country on Valentine's Day. And he joined that day a club no one ever should be a part of. That's why we're here, and I'm so grateful someone with Tom's academic and journalistic uh, acumen has helped us raise this story. And now, I guess, Tom, I, I would like to just conclude by saying <clears throat> thank you for raising your voice. And uh, among the crazy, insane mistruths that you debunk in your book, what's the one ac across the country? Because you and Fred have had so many talks. Um, 
people have reacted to the most or that you find most persistent? And then I want to open up to you for, for questions beyond that. Well, again, thank you, Chris. Thanks for your kind words, and thanks for everything you do, and Brady does as well, because we have other members of the Brady family here today. Not really Brady family as in television, but uh, Brady anti-gun violence group. Well, I think the most persistent is the idea that our armed society is a safer society, and that I couldn't even begin. We'd be here for a week if we uh, introduced all the evidence that totally debunks that. But we just have to look at where the United States stands. Let me give you a couple of statistics here to end off before we get into the Q&A session. And thank you all for coming out. And uh, uh, well, first of all, if we compare ourselves with other high-income countries, so countries that are comparable to the United States, we have a gun homicide rate in the United States that's 25 times, that's adjusting for population differences, 25 times the combined rate for other high-income countries. And the U.S. also has by far the highest inventory of privately held guns in the world. In fact, we have something like 40% of all the privately held guns around the globe. We're 5%, 4 or 5% of the world's population, but we hold about 40% of the inventory of privately held guns around the world. So we're n number one by far. Uh, we're n in great company. Yemen is number two, Serbia number three, and you've all seen, I think, with Serbia now, there's a strong movement because of two mass shootings uh, to turn in th their guns. So we're by far an outlier as far as our high levels of private ownership of guns. And we are a tremendous outlier, 25 times the collective rate of gun homicide around the world compared to similarly situated countries. And I'll just give you one example when you compare the United States with Japan. So United States has, we have about two and a half times the population of Japan. Japan has under 130 million people. Uh, we have 120 guns for every 100 people in the United States. Japan has less than one gun per 100 people. Uh, now, how do we stack up? If we were safer, right, uh, what do we have in the United States? We have 135 people a day now dying of gunfire in the United States. In all of Japan, there's nine gun deaths a year in Japan. Nine gun deaths a year, we have 135 a day. So don't let anybody tell you that we're a safer society with more guns, with a nation of washing guns. Women are at great da greater danger. Children are in greater danger. We're an outlier in terms of mass shootings. We're an outlier in terms of the percentage of the population that's touched personally by gun violence. So don't, that is probably one of the biggest myths. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that. And uh, we appreciate you taking your incredible insights and capability because really at the end of the day what we're fighting here is disinformation and i would encourage you please uh we have copies here of american carnage if you have not already uh, uh bought uh, a copy please do and uh, give it to your friends and family that's the point honestly is all of us need to be better informed about how we can on our own uh, debunk these myths and help others do so too because these are lies and disinformation that are literally killing us yes. um, so with that tom thank you so much and i want to open it up to questions that we may have and i see we have uh someone coming for a question now um, is, is this on? It is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you, can you imagine a device by which the Supreme Court would be forced 
to make a decision on whether there's a personal right to an AR-15? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a little out of my lane, and it's a long story with regard to the Second Amendment and how it's interpreted. According to, you probably know Warren Berger, former Chief Justice, who was a conservative, said that this whole idea that Americans have the right to gun ownership, according to the Second Amendment, was a complete fraud. Anyway, you're know, aware of the long-standing debate. Uh, unfortunately, as Fred has frequently, my co-author, has frequently noted that the, um, when the uh, previous decision, the Heller decision of 2008, which for the first time broke with the past and recognized that Americans had the, uh, you know, the, interpreted the Second Amendment as Americans having the right to gun ownership, they talked about firearms in common use. And following that, the gun industry went on a strong uh, campaign to sell these weapons of war so that they would become more in common use. And we've seen that, as I mentioned earlier, for those who weren't here. Now 25% of all firearms sold in the United States are these AR-15 style weapons. So uh, they are now becoming in common use. So that can be certainly argued in relation to any ban. But I think Chris is closer to this issue because I know Brady is involved in trying to look at, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but an assault weapons ban or restrictions and uh, probably more in touch with the ongoing litigation that's happening now. Well, it, yeah. there is ongoing litigation. Um, I, Ten states now have passed uh, assault weapons bans uh, and, and Brady in most of those instances have helped those states pass those bans. We are also helping to defend those bans, um, mm -hmm. including in a case that is now before the Supreme Court um, uh, that will be heard in the next session. And uh, it's a tough Supreme Court, as we know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we feel reasonably okay with the arguments that we're making. And a lot of the argu arguments we're making, uh, consistent with what Tom has said, is about the history of the Second Amendment that is categorically true. <laughs> so that's helpful, we think, which is that the Second Amendment is a collective right, not an individual right, and that uh, Weapons of war don't belong in places of peace. And when you look at the kinds of things that we're seeing happening in schools, in too many public places, it's not a surprise that the weapon that is often used is an assault style weapon, often um, affixed with a high capacity magazine, often, with a hundred rounds or less, or, or more, and it's without any kind of check often that those accessories are bought. And I just want to arm you, sorry for the analogy, but with, with some facts around that, which is if you were to go hunting in any state in this country, doesn't matter where, from Alaska to Virginia, you could not bring an assault style weapon or a high capacity magazine. It would be outlawed. It's unfair to the animal. But this is the world we live in that we have not fairly regulated the sale of these weapons and these accessories. And if you read Tom and Fred's book, they'll arm you with those facts. So um, we're hopeful, but obviously this court is one with certain justices who, um, to get there, were financed in large part by the gun industry. We're hoping, knowing that they have life term tenure and perhaps 
the animosity and upset of people like you um, that they can do the right thing around something that is a blight and shame in American life. Hold so. on. Yes. It's been great. Can you tell me, do you have information about Republican or Democrat who have lost more children or adults? And is there a reaction to those people yeah. when it does happen, saying, I'm yeah. a Republican, I'm sorry. I, mm. Yeah, well, you know, normally we don't keep statistics, FBI and so forth, on party affiliation of victims. However, that said, red states, a Republican governed states that tend to have looser gun laws and tend to have higher levels of gun ownership also have higher rates of firearm mortality. So that's very consistent. And one of the other things, uh, you know, there's a myth about it's all happening there in the inner city. I don't have to worry about it, which is often, you know, a code word for people of color. I don't have to worry about it. I'm a white person or what have you in the suburb or in some rural area. Now, we've seen just looking at all the venues that have been affected by mass shootings and that, as Chris mentioned earlier, there is no venue that's immune uh, from shootings and mass shootings. But here's one statistic. There was a study done not long ago that found that of all the counties in the United States, 13 of the top 20 in gun homicide are rural counties, many of them in the South. So, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, the problem is, resides only in one part of the country is not true. And in fact, red states, you know, there is a trend that we see. The more guns, the higher the rate of firearm mortality from state to state. And, and county to county, and we see that internationally as well. It's not the only factor. I would, I would be telling you a lie if I said that the only thing that determines our levels of firearm deaths and firearm homicide is the number of guns out there. But it is an important factor because there have been studies that have shown that while the United States actually is only in the middle of the pack in terms of violence, compared to other Western countries, we stand out in lethal violence. And so it would be, as the authors of the study that looked at this said, it uh, would be a tremendous evasion to not consider the weapon, the availability of firearms as a key factor in the fact that the United States stands out so much in lethal violence. Yes. Um. <clears throat> When the pandemic started, yes. um, I did, let me know if this is true. I read that um, many shops were closed except for grocery stores and gun stores. And the mm -hmm. reason that the gun stores were not closed was the Second Amendment was protecting the, the opening of the gun stores, that they yeah. remain open because people had their Second Amendment rights. Yeah, Is they, that true? They were deemed essential. They were deemed That's essential. True. Yeah, in certain yeah. areas. That's true. And we did see an increase, a very dramatic increase, in gun-related homicide and okay. mortality during the pandemic. Now, I wouldn't relate the two, but it's fascinating that gun stores at least in many states, were seemed to be immune from closure. Um, yeah. yeah, just to just to elaborate on that, they weren't immune per se from closure. Uh, President, former President Trump, mm -hmm. uh, declared them an essential yeah. service, and therefore, like CVS and other. Um, entities providing things like COVID vaccines, gun stores had a similar emergency declaration across the country. And what we saw as a result of that is during COVID about a 64% increase in gun sales mm. against the backdrop of COVID. And now what we're seeing as an after effect, which we predicted, but sadly, very upsettingly, is um, an increase in gun violence, and that's what we're seeing, too. So 
uh, it's very disturbing, uh, uh, the reality of it. But th that Thank was you. a lot of lobbying from the gun industry. So what you're saying is that the um, ex-president, um, because of lobbying from the gun industry, um, asked that the gun stores remain open because they provided an essential service like drugs at the pharmacy for people who required them. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You have cited so many extremely good examples to say why America is an outlier compared to just about so many other countries. Have there been any behavioral science studies done as to why, because when I look at some of the gun owners here, they seem to be educated groups, they seem to be you know, working in tech industry, they seem to be people with, with you know, high IQs and so on and so forth. So has there been any behavioral science studies done as to what makes, uh, what makes people you know, prefer gun ownership? Yeah. Well, you know, one country that I consider is parallel in many ways to the United States is Australia. Yes up until 1996, because they've had a strong gun law be a frontier history. They had a federalist system where the laws were, up to 1996, stayed based. Mm -hmm. But then they had their horror. Yes. And in that case, and I'm glad you came to this, ma'am, and asked this question, because Australia, and at the time that this horror happened, 35 people were murdered in a mass shooting, uh, a large number of others. Uh, uh, were injured, and uh, John Howard, yes. then the Prime Minister, he's a conservative, just got into office, and he basically led the country, uh, you know, to change. He pressured the states to come along and forge an agreement where national law, he had more national laws, including a, a strict licensing system, uh, a ban on certain types of weapons, like military-style weapons, and so forth. And they literally melted down a third of the inventory of firearms in Australia. People returned their guns, but they were given a fair market price for them. Now, uh, what was the difference between there and here? There is the Second Amendment, and that's controversial, but it is an ob obstruction. It is an impediment. But apart from that, it was the outrage in Australia. Despite the fact that there was high gun ownership there and a history of gun ownership, strong gun lobby, the prime minister who had death threats all over the place, is 90% of the public wanted to see change. Now I am, you know, despite all the impediments, I'm hopeful because we've, I think, reached a point of about 80%, according to some recent polls, of the public want to see change because they're seeing things that they can relate to, like the person knocking on the wrong door, getting in the wrong car, which I've done many times, turning in the wrong driveway. That can happen to me. It can happen to anybody. So I think this has had an impact on Americans, uh, which is shown by recent polling. So I think the difference is between, say, United States and Australia, is we haven't reached that level of outrage, but we're getting there. So uh, that's all I can say. That Taking a long time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think Except any kind of uh, formal behavioral science studies might really help because right. right now behavioral science is being used for prison reform and so many other areas as to right. how to change the behavior of people. And right. if that can change the behavior in Australia, yeah. it should be able to change the behavior. Well, what we're here. trying to do by debunk debunking these myths in this book oh, yeah. is to bring about changes in public opinion and their awareness of the fact that the guns make you less safe, gun ownership to the average person, studies have shown, increases the likelihood of a homicide in the home threefold. You know, so there are, have been studies, very credible studies that show that the guns raise the risk of homeowners. And um, uh, so we're trying to bring all this to the attention of the public because they're buying in, the, many of people have bought into the narrative of the gun lobby that, you know, the armed citizenry idea, you know, get a gun, you'll be safer, your family will be safer, more people are carrying guns today. So by achieving change in public opinion, we're hoping to achieve change in behavior, 
and as well as uh, change in terms of who people are going to vote for. So, you know, unfortunately, it's not an overnight process. Thank, Thank you. you. More kids are killed by gun violence now. Yes, exactly. There, as Chris that mentioned, it's the number one cause of death. <laughs> That's right. I see we have a handsome gentleman who has lined up to ask a question, who is also my partner. I'm sorry. You're sorry. very kind. And I understand this is the last question. Um, as you know, I have a very uh, long relationship, both uh, personally and professionally, with guns. And I am frequently aghast at the over-romanticization of the gun in America and gun culture. Can you talk briefly about your thoughts and efforts uh, to address cultural norm change to help address that? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, the idea that the you know, majority of Americans, people think around the world we have a gun fetish a gun lust, only a third of Americans are gun owners. Only about 6% of, 6 of Americans own about two thirds of the guns in this country. So they're, you know, the ones, the extremists, for example, and I'm not saying everybody has a big gun collection is an extremist. They make up a very small percentage of the population, but they have a disproportionate voice. They're single issue voters and uh, they make a lot of noise. They uh, call their members of Congress a lot. Uh, they mobilize in many different ways. But as far as norm change, what we're trying to achieve, besides changes in law, and changes in, is, are changes in behavior. Because if people come to realize that a gun in their home is more likely to hurt members of that household, it's about, one study showed, 22 times for every intruder that's shot, 22 shootings happen to members of a household. So it's 22 times the risk right. to a member of the household. If people start to understand that, they may not be as eager to have a gun in the home. Gun carrying the same thing, that it puts the carrier at risk, at, in peril. Now, how do I know that? In Florida, we're just passing, by the way, July 1st, Florida will become the 26th state not to require a permit to carry. No training, no knowledge of the law, no nothing. It's like handing somebody the keys to the car and saying they haven't learned dri to drive. They don't know the rules of the road. Here, go for it, you know, drive. And then we expect to be safe, a safer society. So um, it's when you look at that, uh, it, it just boggles the mind. But in terms of the course that they had in Florida up to uh, July 1st of this year, because I took it, the course to carry it was about a three-hour sham course led by business interest, you know, like the NRA trained uh, personnel and so forth. One of the things they taught in that course is you better get insurance uh, because you may shoot somebody and then you could be in legal peril. So they were acknowledging in their own way this was about half an hour of this three-hour course, presumably training, to use a gun is you better buy this insurance, which of course the NRA also had an interest in. Okay, so that was an example of the type of uh, norm, you know, um, type of training that people are getting, uh, and the, uh, you know the falsehoods around the safety relating to the carrying of guns. So uh, there's so many different norms that can be shifted through changes in public opinion. And uh, that's what we're that's what we're trying to achieve. Oh, and yeah. I think we have. Thank you for that brilliant question. You're very kind. I don't know if the answer was as brilliant. I think but it was brilliant. <laughs> I'll say it was brilliant. Yeah. We and I am going to allow one more quick question. Sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, for doing this for speaking today. Thank you. Um, my name's Sanan. I uh, lived in lived grown up in Parkland, Florida. Oh, yes. My entire life. Um, at the time of the MSD shooting, I was at West Glades Middle School, uh, which is one football field away. Right. So it's like yesterday. I remember Absolutely. that whole, the whole, um, you know, the whole event and the whole, the whole day. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of my friends been impacted. Uh, Fred Gutenberg has been a godsend to our sure. community, and so actually that's why I, I knew about today's event was through him. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, we saw. 
detailed. Of course, a lot of the tragic, the tragedy and everything that happened. Uh, we've seen some incredible activism as well. Uh, you know, Alyssa's law passed in Texas recently. Uh, we've saw the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act in Florida. So my question is, um, with all the legislation that we're seeing, uh, is, is there some hope that you foresee with some of the new legislation that we should be championing and advocating for, whether it's in the state legislatures or in Congress or, or anywhere else? And I just want to say thank you for, for doing this and spreading this message. Thank you. I appreciate it, Sinan. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming forward. And I know, you know, my heart goes out to you because everybody in that part community was traumatized because they knew somebody or multiple people who were affected and families that were traumatized. Um, you know, I am hopeful because I see, as I mentioned earlier, that more young people are involved. First of all, you know, the Student Demand Action Group their number of chapters have increased. We're seeing more what you might call gun sense candidates around the country from the two Justins that we've seen in Tennessee standing up and uh, bringing about change because the governor in Tennessee who was opposed to any kind of uh, policy change is now looking at convened a meeting with the state legislature uh, to look at red flag laws, for example, which he was not favorable to before. Uh, we have more, see more people being elected around the country who are activists in this area. So I would urge you too to go, come forward because this is such an important issue, you know, and run for office or convince your friends <laughs> to run for office because that's, uh, that's really critical. We have in Florida, by the way, just a final point uh, because I think there are hopeful signs around the country and uh, legislation in some states that's hopeful. We have Maxwell Frost in Florida who's in Orlando. He's 25 years of age, a brilliant young man, very articulate. Uh, so we have people like that now running for office. So I'm hopeful, but we really need to get young people out to vote because I know that they are so strong in their determination both to run and to get out and vote because so many don't vote. And you know they need to empower themselves because they have the most skin in the game. And maybe their young siblings are going through school if they're done with school. So we need them to come forward and contribute. But thank you for your question today. Thank you so and much. thank you for your interest in this area. I appreciate God you. Bless thank you. you. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. We really appreciate it. I think uh, the only thing left to say is please go buy American Carnage, share it with your friends and family, and talk about this issue. All of you can make a difference. So thank, thank you. Thank you, and I'll sign the books. I'll stick